everybody. It's a different hey now. Like we all know, when Matt is gone, I take over. It's the Nick Wars time show. I'm running the ship for this next probably hour or so. I'm not going to have a two plus hour long solo cast. One, because there's really not too much to talk about this week because we are mere days away from the start of Celebration 2022 as I record this on Tuesday, May 24th. Um, so that means that Disney and Lucasfilm are, are holding their position until until the Star Wars celebration starts. We do have a few things to talk about, a new TV spot that has popped up uh, online over the last few days that shows a couple of seconds of new footage, but overall... Um, just another hype builder for the Kenobi series. Uh, we got some information on who, who Kumail Nanjiani is going to be playing in the Kenobi show. Uh, I'll talk about that for a little bit because I think he has some parallels to a character that we've seen in the past. And a big Andor announcement that I don't believe Matt and I touched on last week, even though it, it dropped. I think it dropped on the day that we were recording the podcast or the day after. So... Still have some stuff to talk about. Plus, of course, we have the top five. We have the question of the week to make sure that our fans get the attention they deserve from our weekly show. So do not fret. We will still pay homage to the fans this week. Sorry for those of you who did make the top five. that This isn't a live show, but I will speak your name when we get to that part. But... Uh, to kick things off, I know that that Matt and I usually have a little BS session just about what we've been watching, what we've been doing. Um, and while Matt is frolicking happily on the beach and and zipping around on his one wheel, um, I have been home and my girlfriend and I just started watching. This may sound weird. I know this may sound like old people shit or whatever. We just started watching the real world New Orleans homecoming season on Paramount+. Plus. And I have to say that it, it it's it's some good stuff. If you if you were ever a fan of the real world in the past, or if you had seen the original New Orleans season, um, season nine, uh, it's definitely worth a watch. It's very compelling television, and like um, I don't usually say that for reality shows. Like um, we we don't often watch reality shows. The only reason that we chose to watch the original season of the Real World New Orleans, which came out originally in 2000 um, was because I'm from there and we just had this idea. It's like, Oh, let's watch it and see if like you recognize any places, see if you recognize any people, um, anything like that. Uh, But after watching the initial series and then knowing that the homecoming uh, season was coming out soon, um, we, we kind of powered through the first, the original and then started watching the uh, homecoming season few days ago and pleasantly surprised at how good it is. Um, So if you wanted a a reality TV show recommendation, there's one for you. And um, other than that, really not too much has been going on. I just picked up Switch Sports, which uh, Taylor and I plan on playing today or sometime this week. Uh, We were huge fans of the original Wii Sports when it first came out. Obviously, we didn't know each other at that time. Um, but Wii Sports was always fun, so I'm really interested to see how Switch Sports is going to play out on the big screen television. Um, yeah, I mean, catch up on Real World New Orleans, watch the original season on Paramount Plus, watch the homecoming season. Super good stuff. Pick up Wii Sports or pick up Switch Sports so you can get a little exercise in, play some tennis. They even added soccer, comes with a leg strap, so you're actually using your legs to play you're not just you know swinging your hands around to try to kick a soccer ball you actually get to use your legs to kick the ball so that's pretty cool um and yeah uh only other thing that we've been watching pretty regularly is entourage um that was a show that taylor had not seen before and i had seen all the way through and uh we we're pretty deep into that now she's really enjoying it i maintain that while the show does have like a very bro exterior like it's just like super in your face with like, oh, they're just talking about women. They're talking about all this like kind of weird bro stuff. Once you kind of scratch past that surface, the show has incredible storylines, great character development. Um, definitely one of uh, HBO's highlight shows, I would say. 
Um, so, so give that a watch if you haven't either. Um, and then also there's a show on Netflix called Old Enough. It is a the cutest little show in the world where um, Japanese families, typically in smaller Japanese villages, will send their children out between the ages of two and four years old on their first ever solo errand. And they're followed by cameras the whole way through. But it's just really fun to get to see, you know, these little kids have to go to the market and pick up, uh, you know, pick up noodles for their parents or go bring their dad their coat that they forgot at home that day um, just to see how they interact with their world and how they interact with all the people they have to talk to along the way to make sure that they finish this air. And it's very cute. Um, so if you haven't seen that yet, the episodes are only about 15 minutes long. Some are some are a little bit longer. Some are a little bit shorter. But it's def- if you need like a nice palate cleanser before you go to bed, just something to put you in a good mood right before uh, you hit Dreamland. Give uh, Old Enough on Netflix a watch. It is is a super fun show. But we have now completed our non Star Wars talk for this episode. We're about five and a half minutes in, so definitely not the full length bullshit session that me and Matt usually give you, but a a protracted one because there's only uh, there's only one of us here today. So what we'll start off with first is like I mentioned. The new Kenobi TV spot that dropped on May 23rd yesterday. Um, it's a 30 second TV spot and it does contain some new footage. You know, there, there, there are a few new clips, maybe some voiceover that you hadn't heard before. Um, but in general, it's, it's just another hype builder. I think the, the coolest thing that you get to see in, to physically see in this trailer is you actually get to see a moment on Tatooine when Reva ignites her saber and holds it up to Owen's neck, um, which is likely the scene that precedes or that precedes uh, the one where we see Owen confronting Kenobi and, and really calling him out saying like, hey, you're bringing all of this problem here. Like you're the reason that these people are here now. You're the reason that these people are being, you know, that that my people, Tatooinians, are being killed um, because they're searching for you. So it was really cool to kind of get that preceding narrative. And then also you get some voiceover from the Grand Inquisitor talking about what is required to hunt Jedi. Um, and it really does a great job of, of, of building the narrative around, like, they're not just going to, like go to Tatooine to find Kenobi like they're hunting it requires patience and everything that 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 comes along with hunting a Jedi so I thought that the the voiceover inclusion of the Grand Grand Inquisitor was cool I thought the scene showing Reva actually having a saber to uh Owen's throat was was actually very telling um and it gives a reason behind the confrontation that he has with Kenobi especially in the market um So that was a cool little spot. You can check it out. I'll have the link to that, um, to that post listed on the podcast, uh, article. So make sure to click into that and then click into the new Kenobi trailer because it's out there. It's out there in the wild. So check it out. Next topic is a bit of Kumail Nanjiani news. Kumail we knew had been associated with this show for a while. We also knew that from some of our sources that he was listed. He, he, he spoke of himself as a friend to Obi-Wan Kenobi. He didn't really give any character details on who he was playing or what his character archetype was, even though he mentioned that the archetype itself had been seen before. Um, he never mentioned his name. He never really mentioned too much of of the character details around himself, but now in an e- uh, or in an interview with entertainment weekly, Kumail actually revealed the name of his character and um, essentially what his character is uh, in the show and, and how he may interact with, with Kenobi along the way. So um, Kumail's character's name is Haja, H-A- H-A-J-A, Haja, and he is a native of Dayu, or at least he, he works on the streets of Dayu as a con man. Um, and, and really all that Haja is worried about at this point in his life is survival, just surviving on the streets of, of Dayu, whether it be by hook or by crook, it seems. Um, and this is a quote from, from 
Kumail from the EW article about Haja. He says he's sort of, he's the sort of con man guy who cons people for money. That's what's important to him. And then he has a run in with Obi-Wan and suddenly he sort of gets stuck in the bigger conflicts at play, which is the thing that he really tries to avoid. Uh, so he's this street level con man guy who gets embroiled in stuff that's way too big for him and he has a choice to make. So that's that's kind of where he he positions it. And previously, when we were talking about Kumail's character, he had mentioned that the archetype was something that we had seen in Star Wars before. And I think the closest like really the closest archetypal character that you can draw to what Kumail has described with Haja is probably DJ from uh, TLJ from The Last Jedi. And, um, and the reason I say this is because DJ was an originally brought to us and, and, and presented to us as a slicer. He's like, he's this guy. He can get you into the... The, the cage or he can get you into the, the, the system that can get you then into Snoke's star destroyer. Like he can slice that wall, get you in. Um, but what ended up happening was, I mean, DJ technically wasn't even the character that they were describing that way. It was another character, um, that was on the casino planet that ended up getting hassled hard and then like they couldn't get in contact with him. So once, um, you know, once they were in prison, then they met DJ. DJ said that he could do the job and he did the job, but also DJ ended up being a con man. DJ helped them to the degree that, uh, that he could, but also when it was very clear to him that there was more money to be made, uh, by, by turning on them, he, he turned on them. Like he flipped, got them arrested, made sure that, the sabotage that was trying to ha- that was, you know, being attempted on the start of shore wasn't going to go down. Um, so Finn, Finn gets captured, almost gets his head cut off. And then luckily for, for Finn, that's when all the, the madness breaks loose on the start of shore and, and the movie continues from there. But the character archetype of a con man, I think is, is pr- that's probably what Kumail was, was alluding to when he said that, this type of character has been seen in Star Wars before. Um, it's it's DJ almost for sure. I mean, you can probably go back and, and think about other characters in the series and see if you can draw comparisons there. I don't think that you can consider Hondo a con man because he typically does um, keep his word to the people that he makes it to, especially in the dealings that we've seen with him in the animated series in rebels with Ezra and the Phoenix crew and, in uh, in other episodes that we've seen him in as well. So, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily consider, um, consider him a con man and just trying to think through all of the other pieces of content that we have out there. There's definitely no, con man archetype that we've seen in any of the movies prior to DJ. I don't think that there was one that you could necessarily point out in the prequel trilogy or the original trilogy. The closest you could say was, was Lando. Lando was a bit of a, was a bit of a con man, you know, like that, that's kind of how he made his living. Lando definitely made his living, got, the the Falcon and got a lot of what he um what he achieved in life through being a con man. Like he would he would lie, cheat, and steal in any way that he could. We saw it when he was playing cards in in the solo movie where he was just he literally had a, a little mechanical arm inside of his sleeve that would feed him cards that he needed. Um and we know that that's how he won the Falcon and we also know that that's how he uh, apparently came into uh, Bestman, uh, the Cloud City mining mining facility was was through uh, made with somebody else. So so that's always been a part of Lando's nature, and you could argue that that he's also a good archetypal fit for a con man. Even though at, in the end he does kind of flip over to the side of good, realizes that what he did with Vader was really fucked up and and he tried to make it right as much as he could so um 
Lando, DJ, those are probably your two best, uh, your two best archetypal fits for what we may see from Haja in, in the Kenobi series. Uh, but it is cool to, to finally like be able to put a name to Kumail's face on the show to, to have an idea of what we may see from this character. Because I do think that having him in this interesting role of, of like essentially somebody who could try to con Kenobi initially, you know, like somebody who's out on the streets and, and sees Kenobi as a mark. Uh, I'm sure that he knows the people who are walking through Dayu who don't fit in. So he may see Kenobi the first time and think like, oh, this is an easy mark. And then is a little bit over his head because he didn't realize that his easy mark is a, a Jedi master. So uh, very interested to see how his interactions with Kenobi go. And then uh, what choice he has to make because Kumail definitely put a, put a big emphasis on that, that he has a choice to make at some point, kind of like DJ had a choice to make kind of like uh, Lando had a choice to make, you know, both of those characters at specific points in their, in their individual films had choices to make that, that wildly swung the fortunes of the main group, the main cast. And I mean, in both instances, they chose for the worse, you know, they chose to, to turn against their allies or who, who we thought were their allies. Um, Han Solo gets captured, put in carbonite, and then we go on the journey that we go on in the beginning of Return of the Jedi to get him free because of the choices that Lando made. And then for DJ, while there was an immediacy to the choice that he made to flip on the Empire, he did get a lot of money and he got he got Finn and Rose captured. Um, but the uh, the follow through wasn't necessarily as as long tail as the as the Lando decision follow through. It kind of it, immediately got shunted to the side once the the chaos started to happen on the on the bridge of of Snoke's star destroyer so i'm very interested to see if if that's going to be a if it's going to be another choice like that where haja is going to have to make this choice between do i give up kenobi or do i lie to the empire do i do i try to hide this man and and, and keep him safe um, so it, it will be interesting to see how that all plays out. But yes, Haja is who Kumail is playing on. He's going to be on Dayu. So once we hit Dayu, he'll be there working the streets, conning people, and then he will eventually run into Mr. Hello there, Kenobi himself. So awesome stuff there from the EW article, uh, the interview with Kumail. There's another quote in there that you can read to just introducing his character and kind of talking a little bit about Dayu. Uh, the, our post will be linked in the podcast article, like always. So make sure to click into that if you're listening and then read the full context of the story. There you go. Um, the last huge piece of news that, that I wanted to talk about was the Andor series confirmation of a late summer release for this year. I was definitely like Matt and I had talked a lot about the a lot about the Andor series, mostly because it was the series that we had heard so little about. Um, there was that there was so little buzz about even during its even during its filming. There was there wasn't really like this huge buzz that you've seen around Andor like we have seen around Kenobi that we have seen around even Ahsoka to this point has a lot more buzz because of the the names and the faces that are going to be in that show. Um, for Andor, it has been relatively low key and it's likely because you don't have one of these tent pole characters in it, you know, with, uh, with the Mandalorian, you didn't really need a tent pole. The Mandalorian established the star Wars TV verse. So you didn't need somebody like, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You didn't need somebody like Ahsoka Tano. You didn't need somebody like Luke Skywalker and initially to sell it because people were more interested in it just for it being what it was the first live action Star Wars television show ever. Um, now that we've had a few of these releases, you know, we've had Mando season one, we've had Mando season two, we've had uh, the book of Boba Fett. So we're now we're pretty deep into this, the, into this Mando verse, this live action TV universe of Star Wars. Um, people are now starting to look for like, okay, well, what can we like when a show comes out, what can we gravitate towards for the book of Boba Fett? It was Boba Fett. It was the first time that he was being reinserted back into new canon. 
um, in a meaningful way. Like he he's going to be there and we're actually going to see what happened to him after the the famous fall into the Sarlacc pit at the uh, at the beginning of Return of the Jedi. That was the seller. Ahsoka, clear seller. The the seller is right in the name, Ahsoka. Um, everybody who has ever watched Star Wars animated um, will will for sure list Ahsoka Tano in their top five Star Wars characters of all, of all time, whether it be just storyline wise or, or or whatever other measure you want to rank her to. She always makes it into that category for a lot of people, and it's because of how well Dave Filoni and the writers um, of Clone Wars and even of Rebel Simon Kinberg bringing him in were able to flesh out her storyline and and really make her a persistent part of this universe. So I think that's why uh, Andor has really kind of been out of the spotlight for, for that period of time. Um, so the, the fact that it's coming out in summer of this year is actually pretty, pretty interesting. Um, I would have figured that for a late summer release, we may have already started to see some stuff start to leak out because I mean, if you think about it this way, I mean, late summer is in what, two and a half months, you know, eight, once you get to the middle of August, you're starting to get to the, uh, the, the end of summer. And right now we're on, we're, we're at May 24th, May 24th. So, you know, that, that summer's right around the corner and you had, you basically have, we're assuming that this is going to get potentially late August, early September release. Um, I'm surprised that there hasn't been a little bit of something yet, but more than likely, like I said at the beginning of this episode, um, Lucasfilm and Disney are holding their their position until Celebration. And then I assume Celebration is going to be the bingo bango. Hey, this Friday, Kenobi comes out, two episode premiere, and then here's the here's what everybody's been waiting for. You've heard about Andor. You've seen set pics from Andor. You know that this thing is happening. Boom. Here's the first trailer. Here's the first official story trailer. I don't want a teaser. I want a story trailer for Andor. I want to see what we're what this show is going to be about. I want to see the characters that are in play here. Not just, you know, not just Diego Luna's Andor, not just Genevieve O'Reilly's Mon Mothma. I want to see the players. And I, I really hope that's what we get from the first trailer that we're probably going to see at Celebration for Andor. Um, I don't think, and I don't want it, this to sound, you know, derogatory or negative towards the show. I don't think that Andor is going to be as good as Kenobi just because there's the stakes of Andor are kind of already set. We already know, I mean, similar to Kenobi and similar to a lot of characters that, um, you know, we already know how their journey ends. But I think that if you're comparing Andor to Kenobi, there's so much more intrigue in what is the unknown of Obi-Wan Kenobi's life um, when you compare it to Cassian Andor's life. Granted, we've only ever seen Cassian Andor in one movie. For Obi-Wan Kenobi, we have seen him in at least six Um you could you could argue that like um, you know voice lines and stuff like that that popped up in in the sequel trilogy you could extend that to seven eight um, you know into that region as well but like we we just have so much more information on Kenobi's life and we also know that this point that we're seeing the series take place is a very pivotal point for Kenobi not only in his journey to becoming a a a better master and teacher for Luke Skywalker, but also just in his journey of healing and, and living his life post fall of the, of the Republic post massacre of the Jedi post order 66. He has been a hermit and this is the first time that he's ever going to be forced out of his, his hiding um, for, for Cassian. We don't really know what's going to be going on. We know we're we know we're going to see a young Cassian. We we know we're probably going to see the destruction of his home world and 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 the murder of his family at the hands of the Empire. 
Um, but we don't really know what else we're going to get after that. Like we know that eventually he's going to work his way into being one of the most trusted agents that is under the rebellion banner. And that's why Mon Mothma trusts him so much, but we really don't know events that may take place in this show that could build hype or that could uh, be super intriguing for those of us who are invested in in Cassian's character moving forward. Um, Not nearly as much as we know about what's going to happen in the Kenobi series. Um, Even before this series was detailed and and really started to have like leaks abound about what its plot was going to be, we all had a pretty good idea of what was going to happen here. Like we, we all knew that if we're going to have a show about Kenobi, he's going to have to confront the specter of Vader in some way, whether it be physically confronting him like we know is going to happen now, or whether it be through the force um, having interactions with him and, and, and finding out that way. We also knew that there was no way, well, I knew initially, that there was no way that you were going to have an entire series ba- on, for, for Kenobi where you're just following him around Tatooine. Like that was never going to be the crux of the story for, for the series. It was always going to be for some reason he has to leave. Um, and that's, that's what intrigued us about this, about this show. And I think that's why even from the initial kind of um, announcement of the show, there was so much hype built around it because of the character himself and because of where we knew this had to lead. With Andor, we don't really have that. We don't really have the connection of the character that we had with Obi-Wan Kenobi. And we don't really know necessarily where this show is going to take us. Like, we we really don't have any context for, like, what Cassian's life or, or, or specific points in his life that we could see in this show other than his home world being destroyed and, and his family being uh, murdered as well. So, um other other beats along the way we really don't know about. And it's also been one of the few shows so far that hasn't had, at least that I'm aware of, hopefully if there have been, Matt has been protecting them <laughs> and not telling me, but there haven't been massive plot leaks. There haven't been huge story reveals up to this point, at least. Now, after the initial marketing machine starts, I'm sure that stuff will start to leak out because that's when it always does. But up to this point, you know, probably only three months away uh, from release, we still don't really know this that much about this show. And I think that that's really cool. I wish that uh, the Star Wars internet verse, the hollow net could, could function in that way a little bit more often to where we don't have full plot leaks happening and we don't have, you know, big spoilers being released and, and that being the stories that we have to talk about on, on the show. I wish that, that there was less focus on spoilers and leaks and there were more s- stories uh, around building characters and, and, and building plot threads and, and, and stuff like that. And, and really, um, not, not really talking about what's going to happen in the shows because a script leaked, but more, hap- more talking about how does this world continue to build uh, you know, how, how, like, w- what is the end game? You know, what, like, we have all of these interconnected narratives that are now being built through the, uh, the Star Wars TV verse, the Mando verse, as it's being called. Um, what are we building to towards that? Because now with Ahsoka coming out and that being connected to Mandalorian, having Book of Boba Fett out already, um, we know we're building towards something. They talked about this, this MCU style kind of uh clash this this big you know all of these smaller shows building towards this big event and i i want to start to see where that development is going towards now that we have um three distinct properties out that all function in the same universe so i really do hope that ahsoka is kind of the kickoff for that that narrative through line to where we can finally see where this big um, this, this this really big convergence is going to happen between all of these different properties and all of these different characters and and you know who the big bad is going to be. You know, like in the MCU, we found out that it was going to be Thanos, basically right 
when the first Avengers movie ended. If you if you stuck around and if you remember the stinger at the first Avengers movie, it was Thanos kind of sitting on the throne and we were like, okay, he's the puppet master. He is the one that's that's that is clearly pulling the strings to whatever is happening in the universe at this time. And I want to see something like that from the Mando TV verse soon. We, I, I have always assumed that it was Thrawn. Thrawn was the puppet master. He is the one who in some way, shape or form has his hand into the affairs that are happening in the galaxy. Um, We've only ever heard his name once, and that was in Ahsoka's episode of Mando season two on Corvus when she is fighting um, Morgan Elsbeth. Uh, but we haven't really heard anything from him since. We haven't seen him for sure. Uh, so I really want to see the angle that they come at for this this massive convergence of characters for this MCU style event. So um, that's what I'm really looking forward to. Andor's probably not going to be as tied into that. Um, like I was telling Matt, like you still have opportunity uh, for Thrawn to be involved in Andor, given the the storyline timing that we're playing with, especially if we go far enough back into Andor's history. Um, Thrawn is for sure going to be kicking around. Like he was in the Imperial Navy at the time that Andor was functioning as a rebel operative. Um, and we already know that we're probably going to go farther back than the, uh, initial skirmish that he had with Phoenix squadron in rebels. So it wouldn't be surprising to me if we did see him pop up in whether it be in cameo or have some sort of through line to play in Andor because he was such a huge part of the Imperial military, specifically the Imperial Navy at that time. So I think that that would be a cool crossover too, is to have like, to show you Thrawn as a younger, um, younger person, but also a younger, uh, a younger officer in the Imperial Navy. And then you get to come back and see him years later in the Mandoverse timeline as this potentially the new de facto head of the Imperial remnant. I think that that would be very interesting. Um, that being said, there are people who, th- if you read Thrawn's books, if you if you've kind of kept up with with Thrawn, new Thrawn since it's been rewritten by Timothy Zahn into new canon, like doesn't necessarily make sense that he would stick around with the Imperials post fall of the Empire. Like like he was always while he did have loyalty to the Empire, he he had no qualms about like when this experiment ends, whether it be um, him leaving willfully or, or the the empire being destroyed, you would, you always thought that he would go back to the Chiss. At least I did. I haven't read the ascendancy books. I didn't find them nearly as good as the, as the new Thrawn, you know, the new quote unquote, new original Thrawn trilogy. Um, I didn't find them nearly as good. But based off of those three books, I always felt that if if things were to go south with the Empire, he would go back to the Chiss Ascendancy and he would reinsert himself into into their military operations and stuff like that. So we still have to see what happens um, with that character and how they're going to reinsert him into canon or into, well, not reinsert him into canon, introduce him into uh, live canon, live action canon um, and see what their moves are there. But yeah, it's still very interesting to see what Andor holds and and if they will try to make through lines happen between Andor and other series that, that happened far after his time has, has, has passed. So, um, yeah, very intriguing, uh, and very excited to see what, um, what Andor is, is going to bring to the table this summer. So yeah, good, good, good stuff there. And, uh, that's it in terms of stories happening out there. Guys, you know, like I was saying, there's not really a ton of stuff that's that's going to come out this week because celebrations happening for those of you right now that are listening to this on a Wednesday on Wednesday celebration starts tomorrow celebration starts Thursday. So um, highly unlikely that we're going to get any. um, Any huge news that drops prior to that. 
Um, yeah, there we go. That wraps up our main topics for this week. Like I told you guys, we're we're this isn't going to be a long one. There's not a lot of topics to talk about. Uh, a little bit of speculation happened with the uh, the Kumail part, with the Andor and storylines that are that are still happening in the live action TV verse. But we have already, you know, a mere thirty five minutes into this episode, arrived at um this the fan segment. We've already we've already hit it, and the the question of the week for this week from Matt was are you more excited to see the return of Ewan McGregor as Kenobi or Hayden Christensen as Anakin slash Vader? So who am I gonna who's gonna be the lucky few that get into this week's fan segment responses? Um Nathaniel James zero one. I don't believe he's ever had his his response read on the show. He says Love and excited for them both, but I can't wait for more Vader footage. That's so Vader. What a good name on IG. What do you think he says, people? You think he said Vader? Wrong. The answer is obvious, says that's so Vader. Owen Lars. Everybody's waiting to see Uncle Owen. Everybody's waiting. How did he get so crotchety? Why is he so mean to Kenobi? You know, now we get to find out. Like I said, in the new trailer, he had a a Sith Inquisitor hold a lightsaber blade to his neck that probably would put him in a bad mood. Sir Dork 730. Never heard of this guy. Never heard of Sir Dork. But he seems just just from looking at his his profile on Instagram, he seems like he's a good guy. Sir Dork 730 says, excited to see both. I'm a bit more curious, however, to see Hayden reprise Anakin, not Vader, Anakin. I haven't seen Hayden act since Jumper, and it will be super interesting to see his return. I'm also even more curious to see how Hayden acts in the Vader suit. So not only is, is this Sir Dork 730, this, this, this new person in our community, not only is he excited to see Anakin, but he wants to see how Hayden acts in the Vader suit. I, I agree with this person. I think that that is a very, uh, a very good response. Corona Force says definitely more excited to see Ewan, but a lot more curious to see Hayden and how the character slash characters will be handled. Another curious mind towards Hayden and seeing how he will be as Vader slash Annie. Um, Jedi Knight inside says. Tough one. Maybe, maybe just a little more excited to see Hayden as Vader. He finally got his chance. That's right. If you've been a longtime Star Wars Time Show listener, even from back in the Entertainment Buddha days, you will know that that Matt and I were the original Hayden for Vader stumpers. This was way back in the pre-Rogue One days. We were already calling for Hayden as Vader in, in Rogue One. I believe we were probably the only ones doing it, but we were doing it. We were out there. We had the signs. We have the receipts. It's on the internet. We, we put Hayden for Vader out there in 2016 and it happened. So that just goes to show you when the star Wars time show speaks things into the universe, they may take some time, but they will happen. Um, one more response here it says Pro Delgado one. He says, Ewan, it's a shame we won't get to see Hayden's wonderful furrowed brow under that helmet. We may. We may. Pro Delgado one. We may get to see his furrowed brow under that helmet. I'm sure we will. In fact, I'm sure we will get to see the crisp, uh, uh, darkened by fire skin of of Anakin Skywalker, a.k.a. Darth Vader, underneath the helmet. But we'll also get to see the pretty boy look of him as Anakin again, too. That's That, that has been spoken, um, and we know that that's going to happen. So um, seeing, seeing Hayden as a crispy Vader is almost guaranteed to happen. So hopefully, uh, Pro Delgado 1, you get to see what you want to see. There we go. Um, that's the question of the week. Thank you all for responding to it. 
it's great to see there's there's a lot of excitement for both both of the uh both of the prequel bros in 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 this response people want to see Ewan people want to see Hayden for me personally I definitely uh want to see Hayden again I was kind of like Sir Dork um last time that I had seen him was in Jumper I thought he did a good job in Jumper I thought that that movie was super fun um, I always hoped that they would make the sequel to Jumper, which was already a book. It was called Reflex. Um, the only difference between Jumper and Refle- or Jumper and, and Reflex as books to the to the movies is that David, the character that um, that Hayden played in that movie, was actually significantly younger in the books, and they they played him more as an adult in the movie, where he was he was more focused on on the younger David in in the book. So. Um, I was a huge fan of his work there. I was a huge fan of his work prior to joining the Star Wars franchise. Um, and it has been a shame to see that he has essentially been relegated to indie films and, and smaller projects after the Star Wars prequel trilogy had released. Uh, I think he's super talented. I think he does have a bit of a limiting... He does have a limit on what he can do because of just his... I don't know. I don't know how to put this without sounding. I don't want it to sound negative, but like he has a demeanor and his voice has a timber that that really doesn't fit in what I would call tough guy roles. Like he can't play. I don't think that he can play tough guys very well, um, but I think that there are a lot of roles in Hollywood that that he could have and would have been well suited for even after the prequel trilogy. Um, so I was always a huge, a huge fan of, of Hayden's and, and getting to see him again, reprise the role of Vader and Anakin is, is a huge thing that I'm looking forward to. So yeah, super excited about Hayden, super excited about you. And I mean, super excited about, uh, actually getting Joel Edgerton back to play, uh, Owen Lars. I never thought that that was going to happen. I mean, Joel isn't the hugest actor in Hollywood, but he has had some big roles after his time, <laughs> after his literal, uh, you know, 30 seconds as Owen Lars in the original, or not in the original, but in the prequel trilogy. Um, fun to see him back. Fun to see a lot of these characters that we're going to see uh, in play in the Kenobi series. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. Friday. Two episode premiere. Make sure you're there. Matt will be watching it. I will be watching it. We will be talking about it. Um, we're super excited as well. So that's it for question of the week. You know what that means. We're going into the final segment of the show. The top five Star Wars artists of the week brought to you by Star Wars Time Show. This is how the segment works. If you want to get involved, if you want to get your art on here, here's what you got to do. Tag at Star Wars Time Show. When you have any Star Wars related art posts on Instagram, use hashtag Star Wars Time Show on all of your posts on Instagram. We'll see them. More specifically, Matt will see them. Matt will pick out the ones with our tag on it that he really likes. And then from there... He will put them into the folder. Matt's folder of goodness where he stashes all of his favorite images that you guys share with the hashtag Star Wars Time Show and at Star Wars Time Show. That's where the Matt featured photos of the week come out. He shares about six photos every day around that number. The high number of photos to share per week. And from there, I pick the best five. The top five of the week. So make sure, hashtag Star Wars Time Show, at Star Wars Time Show on your IG posts. We will see them. And then I will determine whether you will be enshrined in the top five Star Wars fan artist features of the week. First up this week is at 529 underscore J. 529 underscore J has been one of my favorite accounts to follow recently because he has an awesome, I don't want to call it necessarily irreverent, but he has a very fun mashup style that, that, that produces some really 
uh, really cool and exciting artwork. I, I, I really do enjoy uh, seeing 529GA um, put out his stuff and, and everything around it. So um, I'm a huge fan, huge fan of his work. Um, but what this, what this image is, is this mashup between, um, Deadpool and Star Wars. And we see, it's not even really like a, like, I can't even really tell what's happening, but it's just a fun, like, it's just a fun composition. So what we see, it's a high ground joke is what it is. It's a high ground joke. So you see Anakin on the floor. Move my cat out of the way. You see Anakin on the ground. He's just kind of standing on the ground on like a great, like a graded walkway. There's a little dog, a little sad dog sitting next to his feet. But up above him, stacked two crates high, you see Deadpool sitting on the top crate, kind of waving at Anakin. And you see, of course, Mr. High Ground, Mr. Hello there, Obi-Wan Kenobi on top of the crates as well, just giving an awesome big smile to the camera, a nice peace sign. Anakin is looking upset on the ground, like a, a what the hell kind of look on his face as he stares at Deadpool waving at him from above too. Um, it is a really fun play on the high ground meme. So make sure to go follow at 529 underscore J on the IG and uh, to see all of this amazing artwork that he has. Um, very, very fun stuff at 529 underscore J-A-Y on the IG. It's always fun to see the mashups that this man is working on. Um, next up in the top five is at Nick's N-I-K-S Toy Picks. Nick's Toy Picks. And he has another incredible uh, scene. We saw one last week of, of Casca Reeves kind of cutting through some stormtroopers uh, on a battlefield. And now we have another one that features both Casca and her leader, her night owl leader, Bo-Katan, uh, as they fight their way through an Imperial vessel. You can see in the background that they're clearly walking through some sort of Imperial vessel. Casca is the main focus of this. She's midair shooting one person through the chest and then kicking the other one in the neck while you see Bo-Katan in the background just kind of playing Overwatch, just just covering her back as she comes in and, and, and kicks some Stormtrooper ass. Um, the the post-processing effects by Nick's Toy Picks, awesome, really good, uh, like Sparks and Boca coming off of the gunfire that's going through the Stormtrooper's body. You also get some good flames coming out of Casca's uh, jetpack as she like clearly uses that as a as a point of thrust to jump up and kick this guy in the neck and shoot this other guy in the chest. Clean, beautiful photo work by at Nick's Toy Picks. Next up in the top five, number three, but as you know, this they're not in particular order. There's no one, two, three, four, five here. They're all the best. And joining the best this week is at Masso Art, M-A-S-S-O-A-R-T on Instagram. And Masso here put together a fucking awesome Shogun style representation of Mando um, and little Grogu. So what you see is Mando, except he is in his armor is more designed to look like a Shogun uh, samurai than it is to to look like his traditional armor. And it almost makes him, the first time I looked at this, I was like, oh man, this must be like a really cool take on the Knights of Ren. But actually, because he does, like the helmet itself does look pretty similar to one of the Knights of Ren from the sequel trilogy. But once you see little Grogu there with his little sack and, and uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a katana at his side, but samurai sword at his side, you, you definitely can see that it is a Shogun style representation of, of Mando and Grogu. Um, so Mando, Mando is wielding a pole axe, except the pole axe head is not an axe. It is the dark saber. It is the dark saber blade. And you can see the, uh, the Mandalorian mythosaur crest on that as well. You have an awesome, uh, like, I guess this is like his representation of a jetpack on his back, but the, the top of the jetpack is a dragon's head, which actually makes sense because what do dragons do? 
they breathe fire and that's what he uses to propel his jetpack. Um, it's just a really fucking awesome piece of work here by at Masso art, um, that takes Mando and little baby Grogu and, and, and then kind of drops them right into, uh, feudal Japan era with this, with this style of, of, of artwork and clothing. So awesome work at Masso art, M A S S O A R T on the I G next up. We have at Elchinator dot G G E that is at E L C H I N A T O R dot G G E on I G and Elchinator is looking forward to potentially the next season of either book of Boba Fett or the next season of the Mandalorian. Um, and what we see is Neo Boba, you know, AKA new Boba, AKA new Canon Boba. Uh, he's strolling through the streets of Tatooine with a, with a group with him and his group is consistent of Fennec Shand. Of course, Fennec and Boba are very close friends. Fennec is behind him to the right hand side of the picture Weapon drawn, looking menacing as the the patrons of the Tatooine street that they walk down look on in fear. But another addition to the Boba crew in this image is Mr. Dangar himself. Toilet paper head Dangar is also in the back, kind of giving menacing glares to the standby or, or to the passerbys and to the standbys um, as they make their way through this Tatooine street. Um, you see two Jawas off in the background and then a, a citizen off in the back as well, all looking intimidated as Boba and his crew roll through the streets of Tatooine. Um, I like the take. I like the fact that um, that Elchinator brought in another of the classic bounty hunters to to be a part of, of Boba's crew in this image, also keeping uh, Fennec there as well, showing that that Boba has like kind of a mix a mix of the new and the old. Um, and it, it, it's really cool to, uh, to, to have uh, both sides of those uh, uh, coins represented. Boba's old friends and his new friends with Dengar and Fennec. So very cool shot at Elchinator.gge on the IG. And the last one for the top five this week comes from at Imperial underscore troops underscore optics. And guess what? As his name suggests, it's going to be a buckethead photo, but it's not an imperial buckethead photo. It is a republic buckethead photo. So what we see are some awesome republic troopers lined up, phase two clones. In in the field, you see two of the huge troop transport ships behind them flying, getting ready to kind of fly overhead. It looks like they just they may have just been dropped off onto the field. And these two ships are about to hit back into hyperspace, get off this planet, and let these Republic commandos do their work. Um, I always like, I always like seeing bucketheads. For some reason, uh, bucketheads in pictures just look fucking sick. Uh, in fact, there's only one picture in this week's top five that isn't a, uh, doesn't have a buckethead as its focus, and it's the first one we talked about from at five two nine underscore J uh, with Obi Wan. Anakin in Deadpool. Um, but this shot, yeah, this shot here, uh, Imperial Troops Optics has an incredible, has a great filter on it, kind of like this grainy, um, you know, I don't want to say muddy, but definitely almost like a sandy type filter that you would see in, in movies that are set in like the Middle East desert or something like that, or like, you know, like Gulf War movies has that kind of filter to it. And it just has this gritty, real feel to it. I always love Imperial Troop Optics work because he, it makes you feel like you're you're on the field, that you're in, uh, you know, that that you're actually seeing wartime photographs being taken and shared in real time. He does a fantastic job of portraying that in his imagery, and um, he did that just that right right now with this image of our of our clone trooper friends being dropped off. Uh, for a mission on this, on this, what looks like to be relatively craggy and dry, arid planet. Um, so just super awesome work at Imperial underscore troops underscore optics on the IG. And that's the end of the top five for this week. And for those of you who are aware, for those of you who know how this show works, that's the end of the show. 
like I said, it was not going to be a long one. This is a pre-celebration show. You know, we know what's coming. We Matt and I have already talked about what we're excited about. Like, it's going to be awesome to see Andor footage. It's going to be awesome to see announcements on what's to come. Maybe we get a a look at some Jedi Survivor, the new game uh, that you know featuring Cal Kestis and continuing that story on. Maybe we get a look at some other new games. <gasps> Oh my gosh, multiple Star Wars games at one time? Nick, are you crazy? No, that would be super fun to have, hey, here's Jedi Survivor, but here's the first look at this other Star Wars game that we're working on that we may or may not have heard of. I know that people were super excited about Star Wars Squadrons when it first came out, but I haven't heard anybody talk about or care about that game uh, after two months of it being out. You know, I want something that is persistent. I want something that is story that's going to build the narratives of this galaxy far, far away. So I hope we get to see some of that. Um, I hope we get to see some Ahsoka stuff, you know, like maybe I know it just started filming, but like maybe they had some stuff in the can. Like maybe they have some interviews with cast members and everything like that for the Ahsoka series. I think that would be really cool. Um, And then, of course... You know, I'm not going to be there. Matt's not going to be there, but it's just, it's going to be nice to see Hayden on stage. It's going to be nice to see Ewan on stage talking about Star Wars, talking about Kenobi and and everything else. So uh, a lot to look forward to for those of you going to Celebration, a lot to look forward to for those of us who aren't going to Celebration. Just a lot of good news to come for the Star Wars fans, hopefully. And then maybe, just maybe, if, if the force is truly shining down on us, we may get some information about a movie. doesn't have to be multiple movies. A movie. One of them. Maybe it's Taika's. Maybe we get a little Taika info. Now we know that Taika's movie is for sure going to come out before Patty Jenkins' uh, Rogue Squadron. That has been put out there. Um, so maybe, maybe we get a title. Maybe we get an era. Maybe we get a plot point. Maybe we get something, just something about Taika's movie that can let those speculative juices flow. And and that's that's what I want from Celebration. I want some Andor. I want some some nice happy moments between Ewan and Hayden as they sit on stage. And I want some movie info. And if you sprinkle a little game info on top of that, that's that's sprinkles on top of an already good chocolate sundae. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Let us know what you guys are looking forward to. You can do that multiple ways. You can do it on our Instagram. Leave us comments on our posts at Star Wars Time Show on the IG. Follow us on Twitter too, at SW Time Show. Uh, give us a follow on Facebook too, all the socials. We put all of our articles that we post on Facebook. We put them on Twitter. We put them on Instagram. But you know where the community really is. It's on the IG. But if you want a more personal experience, if you want to get down and talk to some of the other fans of the Star Wars Time Show, there's only one place where you can do that. It's the Discord. Hit our link tree on the IG, on the Instagram. In there, you will find an invite just for you to our discord join the discord have some fun with the people who who interact in that i'm actually starting to take some suggestions from our discord whoa look at me i'm not a discord user but i i have i have solicited the discord for suggestions for a new short form not really new for a returning short form uh uh little video series that I was going to do called less than 12 parsecs. You know, I, that I, I need ideas from the community for that. And the best place to give me those ideas is on our discord. So make sure hit the link tree on the Instagram. You'll see it right there. Star Wars time discord. Click that link. It'll open your discord. And guess what? It'll drop you right in. You'll have access to all our channels the meme channels, the bullshit channels, the the just chatting channels, 
And then you'll also see the new channel that I created, Less Than 12 Parsecs Ideas. If you want to hear about anything Star Wars related that takes less than 90 seconds, put it in there. There's something that you don't know about Star Wars. If you have a question about Star Wars and you think that I could answer it in 90 seconds, put it in there. And maybe I'll make your ideas come to life with a new episode of Less Than 12 Parsec. So that's it, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this roughly one hour long podcast. I'm glad that I could give you some some info leading into Star Wars Celebration. And hopefully when Star Wars Celebration is wrapped up, Matt and I can come back together, have an awesome discussion about what we saw, what we liked, and then what we have to look forward to. So for Nick from the Star Wars Time Show, or from Nick from the Star Wars Time Show, thank you for joining me along this journey. Follow us on the socials. Interact with us on the Discord. And as Matt likes to say, if you listen to the Star Wars Time Show, the Force will be with you always. Goodbye.